Carl, we've been talking about the responsibilities and sense of the, those that are called to the kingdom, that are become part of the kingdom of God. Uh, the Beatitudes set forth what has to take place in order to enter the kingdom of God and then some of the characteristics of a person who is in the kingdom of God. And then we saw that a uh, result of being a kingdom member is that we are both salt and light. Uh, yesterday we looked at what it meant to be salt. Actually the last couple days we looked at what it meant to be salt. Uh, so today we're going to move on to the uh, next thing and that is that you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. If you look in on your uh, your notes there you see that there is an outline and I'm going to give you the the points to fill in that outline and uh, explain it as we go uh, Jesus says uh, or, that we are the light of the world and there are certain things that we should uh, know about light well let me ask you we'll do the same thing you do with salt uh, what do you think of when you think about light? Shines in darkness. It shines in darkness. Okay, what else? What's the relationship between light and darkness? Opposites. Uh, you might think of it that way, but it's not exactly opposite. What do I? Why do I say it's not exactly opposite? <laughs> Darkness is the absence of light, not the opposite of light. You follow? So what so what does that say about the relationship between light and darkness? If darkness is the absence, light is greater than darkness. Light is greater than darkness. Because when light comes, there is no darkness, right? It drives away darkness. As you uh, learned in John 1 concerning Jesus as the light. What did it say about darkness? Darkness cannot overcome it. Yeah. So if there's light, darkness just can't take that away. The light drives away the darkness, not the other way around. Okay, what else can you, do you think about when you hear the word light? When you think about light? What does it do for you? Light your path, which which prevents what? Drift. Uh, not. Yeah. It prevents like not being able to see. <laughs> okay, but what in relationship to your path? What are you doing if you're on a path? Walking. You're walking, and if you have light, that is, should prevent you from what? Falling, Falling. right? Yeah. yeah. It reminds me when I was in Egypt and had climbed what is traditionally Mount Sinai. I think I've uh, uh, told many of you uh, about this before in world history class. But coming down the mountain at night where, where there are no lights around at all, it was pitch black. Now, we were able to rent flashlights at the store at the, the base of Mount Sinai, but didn't think that I needed to try out the flashlight before we went up, assuming that this store would sell us or rent to us good flashlights, right? Uh, it wasn't the case. As I turned on my flashlight, I found that the light was so dim, I could only see like the equivalent of like a block, uh, a tile block ahead of me. So it wasn't very useful. But it did keep me from stumbling over what was right there. Anyway, uh, but uh, so we have different degrees of light, don't we? Some light is dim, and some light is bright. Uh, do you have lights in your house that are dimmer than, and some lights are, are brighter? Yeah. In fact, we have three-way bulbs that you can ma make it dimmer, or you have a dimmer switch, you can make lights dimmer because maybe you don't want all that bright light. How many of you are in a situation where you wake up in the morning, somebody turns on a bright light? Okay. Uh, is that is that annoying? Is it useful? No. Does it get you up? No. <laughs> Sometimes it does. All right. Anything else you can think about light? 
What else does light do? <clears throat> what if you were uh, lost out in the woods someplace? What might light tell you? And you don't have a flashlight. Yeah, you might, if you see a light out there in the distance, you know there's civilization, right? So you find your way. Well, let's look at uh, light in regards to those things and some other things as well. So, uh, first of all, uh, and I've entitled this, You're Delightful, because that's what Jesus is saying about us as light. We are light for a benefit to others. All right, the first thing is the preference of light. You can't fake it. In other words, for me, my preference is that it is uh, something that's real. Uh, something that uh, doesn't have any uh, falsity about it. Uh, you're, you're either light or you're not. It's either a light or it's not a light. Uh, and you can't fake it. And as children of God, uh, you, we either are light or, or we're not. Secondly, the, prom the prominence of light. You can't miss it. If there's light shining in a dark place, you can't miss it, right? It's there. And the same way uh, for us. Uh, if we are shining, people are not going to be able to miss us as being the light. Okay? I'll pause for a moment and let you catch up. Bless you. And we see this prominence of light reflected in what Jesus said concerning light. When he said, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. It's impossible for a city to be hidden if it's up on a hill or a mountain and there's light there. You're going to see it. And even uh, down in this area, I think probably, I know certainly if when you drive up a little further north at night, you can see light from the city of Youngstown. Uh, you just see kind of light in the sky. Uh, that's part of what's made it difficult for us to be able to see all the stars at night that uh, we used to be able to see uh, because of what's called light pollution. There's so much light uh, in our cities and our houses and, and so on that uh, that infiltrates our sky so that we're not able to see stars like we used to be able to. I remember um, even back when I was a kid when there was less light pollution, being able to look up and see you know, the Milky Way, you know, see all the stars up there. And uh, it's very difficult to do that anymore because we have so much light pollution. Unless you go to some part of the world where there's not. Like if you went to Egypt or you know, maybe some place in, in South America or Africa, uh, there are some places in the world where there's not much light pollution uh, and you can see many more stars. But a city on a hill can't be hidden. So we are visible. All right, next is the prohibition of light. You can't hide it. All right, so first, the preference, you can't fake it. Secondly, the pro, or the uh, prominence, you can't miss it. And thirdly, the prohibition of light, you can't hide it. Jesus says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Now, you understand in biblical times, of course, they didn't have electricity, as you all know, and they had oil lamps. And... Uh, most people lived in houses that were only one room. And so if they lit a lamp at night to see, they most often would either put it on a, a shelf, an elevated shelf, but if they wanted to light the whole room, they would put it near the middle of the room and up on uh, a, a something that to, to, to put it on, like a stand or, or maybe an overturned basket, something like that. But what would, it, what would it be like? What would you think of somebody who lit a lamp and then put a basket over top of it? Now that, you just don't do that, right? That would be stupid. Why would you light the lamp and then cover it up? And so that's what Jesus is pointing out here. That, that that would not be something that would make sense. It goes against the purpose of having a light to put it under a bowl. 
Uh, and, and to do that, it's not an accident that someone's putting a bowl on top of a light. That's intentional, right? Uh, and, and there's no reason for doing that. And, and to do that would make the light useless. And so Jesus says, that's not what a light is all about. And so uh, don't hide your light. You know, there are times maybe when you've been afraid to let people know that you're a Christian. And you can imagine in some countries of the world, you really have something to be afraid about. But uh, Jesus says, if you've got the light, you can't hide it. it it's going to come out. Uh, you don't cover it up. You should be able to see it. All right? Any comments there? You can't hide it. Uh, next, the pervasiveness. Oh, those are the points I just made. Oh, I didn't say the last thing. It may indicate there's no light source. Um, if, if there's no light coming out of you, if people around you don't see the light of Christ in you, uh, it's either because you're intentionally hiding it or maybe you don't have the light to begin with. Uh, if people don't see Christ in you, maybe it's because Christ isn't in you. And that's a question that we all have to ask. It relates to what we heard at chapel yesterday, too, about examining ourselves to see if we really are in the faith. All right, we got that? And uh, next we have the pervasiveness of light. You know that word? Pervasive means it goes everywhere. You can't limit it. Jesus says instead they put the light on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. You know, and because, like I said, most people at that time lived in one-room houses, that one lamp would light up the whole house for people. So you can't limit light. You can't say, well, I'm just going to let my light shine while I'm at school, but not when I'm at home or not when I'm in the neighborhood or whatever. No, you, if it's true light, it's going to shine wherever you go. Uh, Jesus says in John 1, 9, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Well, that's the light of Jesus, and that's the light that comes through us. Okay, next is the property of light. And that is you can't see without it. It's necessary. You have to have light. Or you don't see. Right? You close your eyes, you don't see. Partly because your lids are closed, but there's, there's no light in there. And some of you have been in a dark room. And you know what that's like to not be able to see. And the reason you can't see is because there's no light. You can't see without it. Jesus says then in verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men. Uh, let your light shine in front of men. Let it get out there. You can't limit it to certain places, certain people. Uh, next, the projection of light. You can't help but see it. Jesus says that they may see your good deeds, and uh, that is, that they can't help but see it. If you're living for Christ, people are not going to be able to help but see the light that comes from you. <clears throat> and I must say that it probably happens really without us thinking about it. You know, if we're, if we're really Christ-centered in our thinking, we don't have to think about, oh, I've got to let my light shine. It's going to happen. It all goes back to being committed to Christ and letting him live through us. Okay, and then we have the purpose of light. And I said you can't beat the result. What does Jesus say is the purpose? He says that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven, or glorify your Father in heaven. See, the ultimate purpose of us being a light in the world is not so people can see us, but so that they can see God and glorify Him because of that. Now, that's not only true of those that already know God, but this is uh, the means of evangelism. When people see our good works, when people see us serving God, that's going to attract them to God. And they'll end up glorifying Him. 
not end up worshiping him because they have seen our light. All right, so these are just uh, some points about uh, light that I think uh, are, that are true of light itself and then that can be transferred in thinking about uh, who we are as followers of Christ. <clears throat> Any questions or comments? So, we'll review a little bit, and then we're going to uh, look at the next few verses. <clears throat> so, we saw in looking at the Beatitudes that we have to recognize our spiritual bankruptcy, as having the right awareness. And recognizing our spiritual bankruptcy, then uh, we realize our desperate condition before God. So, blessed are, are the poor in spirit, spiritually bankrupt, uh, for those, those that mourn, uh, who realize their desperate condition. Uh, and the, then, blessed are the meek, those who submit themselves to God. It, it is something that must take place in us as we come to Christ, that we understand our, our sin and our desperate condition, that we're under the judgment of God, and therefore we submit to God. And then... As a result of that, we will be thirsting after righteousness, hungry and thirsting, or famished for righteousness. And that's something that it can be accomplished in our lives. And then we're told that the right attitude that we have as members of the kingdom of God is that we are sympathetic toward others, that we are merciful to others. And then we have the right devotion, the pure in heart. We are genuine in our uh, attitudes and actions. And then we have uh, the right cause. Blessed are the peacemakers. We are uh, those that try to make peace with other people and ultimately bring people to peace with God. And the right consequences is that if we are living a life dedicated to Christ, we are going to face persecution. And we should consider that a blessing, that we are persecuted. We saw then that as members of the kingdom, uh, we are an a assault team. That is, we are salt in the world, and we are delightful in the world. So we are salt and light in the world. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. All right, now we go to uh, verse 17. You have your Bibles open there to Matthew 5, 17. Or um, and I guess you can switch back and forth between that. And, uh, do I have an outline at this point? In your notes, I don't remember if there's one there or not. Bring it up here again. No. All right, so, oh, well, I have, uh, if you look under paragraph 55, uh, there are a couple questions here, and then. Uh, I have exegesis of the text uh, where we'll look at verses 17 through 20. I'll give you some explanation of the verses, and then we'll fill in the outline for the interpretation of the text. Oh, 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 I forgot about that. Sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, let's look at the application questions about light before we uh, go into the next section here. All right, so uh, get in your groups of three or four and uh, talk about these questions when you're thinking about light. Okay? Everybody see that? The application questions at the end of you're delightful. All right? Give me groups of three or four. If you have trouble finding your group, raise your hand, I'll help you. And talk about the questions there under the application. Thank you. 
Are you with? Uh, Who are you with? Uh, okay. Okay. Who are you with? Brings light to those around you or gloominess. I 
like some kind of like 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 Okay, we have a chance to go through all the questions. All right, let's uh, see if anybody has anything that they would like to contribute here. Uh, is Jesus telling us to be light or that we are light? What did, what did you say about that? Or And what's the difference? What's the difference? Let's talk about that first. Between being light and that we are light. What would it mean if you said you are to be light or if you're saying you are light? Did nobody understand that question? Lexi? Yeah, so if he was saying, I want you to, to be light, that would be, I want you to, to come up with a way to act like light. But if he says you are light, what does that indicate? That you truly are it, and you're not just trying to be it. You just Yeah, so it's more of a natural thing. It's something that comes out of you. You see the difference? So he's... So he's not saying you got to try real hard to be light. No, he's saying, "What you are, the light of the world. You are, not you'll become someday. Now you got to try really hard to be. But if you're following me, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So it should be something that comes out naturally. You know, for I, I think I don't know if I told you. I tell you about my trip to the dentist the other day and what my wife did. You know, she didn't have to think about, oh, let's see, what should I do if I'm going to be like? She just naturally saw somebody in need and said, let that person go ahead of me. You know, it's just something that naturally comes about. All right, so you are the light of the world. Uh, okay, next, whether you, it should be your, did you figure that out? There's a typo. Uh, your fellow students or family would say you're one who spreads a little sunshine or one who disseminates gloom. All right, are you a person that uh, people say that person is pleasant, is a light, or that person is a gloomy person who's always negative? Anybody want to address that? Well, let me ask you this. Who besides yourself would you say in this room is a person that gives light. Who? Amelia? Okay, who else? Anybody else? Anybody else a light giver? Zach. Zach? Yeah. Anybody else? John. John? Who? Mia. Emma? Now, I'm not going to ask you who goes off the window. <laughs> that might not be nice. <laughs> but you can ask yourself that. You know, am I a person that uh, is uh, kind of the downer? <laughs> I'm the person that uh, is, always has the, the cloud rather than the light. All right. Any other comments there? So what? What if you? Uh, and maybe this is something that you could tell a friend in private. You know, when Mr. Henry's talking about the the one giving out balloon. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> Do it in a nice way. <laughs> and then what's the remedy? Because Jesus didn't say. You know, you need to be light, but he said you are light, and if a person's not giving off light, that means one of two things. Either the person a person doesn't know the Lord to begin with, or secondly, there are things that are kind of clouding, clouding up the light, things getting in the way of the light. Maybe 
Uh, we need to spend more time with the Lord, reading his word. That's something that helps increase our light, knowing his word, right? Praying. So uh, those are sometimes, uh, <laughs> Morgan and I were just talking about, because she saw me cleaning my glasses, we were talking about how glasses get smudged and everything. Well, have you ever had a flashlight that was all smudged up? Yeah, the light doesn't come through very well. And so you need to clean the lens. And sometimes in our lives, we need to clean the lens. What if someone has, like, bad depression and they're a Christian? Does that mean, what does that mean? Well, it depends what the source of the depression is. Uh, some people have depression because of medical issues, you know, chemical imbalance, things going on medically. Um, but the vast majority of people who suffer from depression, it's really a spiritual issue and a lack of trust in God. So we, we need to get in God's Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And if we want to have more faith, more trust in God, then we get it by reading His Word. And I, I don't... And I find when I had felt depressed, I knew what I needed to do was read God's word. But it's the last thing I wanted to do. It's just a natural thing. We just, because we tend to want to hang on to that. But reading God's word, I'm not saying it's not like magic or anything. But it almost seems like it. Because I know at times when I have felt depressed, I just start, it doesn't even matter what I'm reading. I start reading God's word and uh, immediately the, the cloud starts to lift and, you know, I started saying, okay, God, I'm not trusting you. That's my problem. I'm not really trusting you. I'm putting my faith in other things. Yeah. What if something like this is a bail or something, and like a Christian in the middle of your depression, does that mean that they have a complete lack of trust in God? Well, and sometimes these things take time to work through, but. Uh, we have, if we trust God that He is in control of everything, He's even He's even in control of things like that, abusive situations, and that's real difficult. But ultimately, we God can get us through that. Uh, but it does mean that we are putting our trust in God in whatever whatever circumstance. Remember what Paul said: "I learned in whatever circumstance I'm in to be content, to be satisfied," and it's not always easy. But that's where God wants us. I remember James said in chapter 1 that we are to have pure joy in all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of trials, all kinds of bad things that happen to us. Why? Because we know that he is working in our lives to bring us into maturity. And if we have trouble understanding how to, ha how to handle ourselves in that, that's where James uh, where, the, where the verse in James 1, uh, if any of you like wisdom, comes in. It's not talking about wisdom in general. It's wisdom concerning how to get through the trial and to keep your eyes on the Lord. Okay, this is, this is real practical stuff here. All right, the next one. If people you see often know that you're a Christian, how do they know? You might have a comment about that. Way okay, the way you act. Yeah, can you think of anything in particular? Okay, has anybody ever had someone say, I, I know you're a Christian or I know you're a follower of Christ because I saw you or even compliment you on something you did? Maybe they didn't say that you're a Christian, but they, they saw something different about you. All right, don't forget about your memory quiz tomorrow, and we'll continue in the Sermon on the Mount.